Hello, everybody, and good evening, and welcome here to 5 by 15 tonight, where I'm delighted that we're going to be joined by Sarah Churchwell and Justin Webb. Um, I'm going to state the obvious, which is unbelievably hot. I'm, I'm melting. Um, there's wildfires raging all over. And over in America, Senator Joe Manchin just announced that he won't support any measures to combat climate change. And he's a Democrat. So what on earth is going on in America at the moment? There's a lot being written about it at the moment, but there is a lot, a lot to say. Our two guests tonight have studied and thought about America and its role in the world for a very long time. And personally, I can't think of two people that I'd rather listen to tonight when there are so many questions out there. Sarah Churchwell is a professor of American literature, as well as being chair of the Public Understanding of the Humanities at the School of Advanced Studies in London. She's written books that take American culture and America's heart and dissect them. Things like the, about the great Gatsby, about Marilyn Monroe. She's also commentated a lot on American history and culture. Now, her new book, which is called The Wrath to Come, which you would have seen on the slide and we were opening, which is about the uh, lies, as she says in the subtitle, the lies that America tells. It examines Gone with the Wind, one of the most enduringly popular and probably influential books and movies in the world. I think it will help us explain some of the divisions that are ripping America apart so badly at the moment. Sarah's book uh, has been through a few hiccups in that the original cover image that she wanted was too problematical. So she's had to put the publication back by a couple of weeks, but our lovely bookstore, New and Books, will take pre-orders tonight. And I couldn't advise you more strongly, but get hold of this one. So she's going to be joined by Justin Webb, who is no stranger to 5 by 15. Indeed, Sarah has been on 5 by 15 and been wonderful before too. Justin was for many years North America editor of the BBC, and he's covered all the twists and turns of politics, the elections, as well as being a senior member of the White House Press Pack. He was also the first English journalist to ever interview Obama. He's published a tremendous book called The Gift of a Radio, My Childhood and Other Train Wrecks. I think you can tell from the title that that's going to be a great book. And indeed, he gave a wonderful 5 by 15 talk about that not that long ago. So do look it up. In the meantime, sit back, get yourself a cold drink, pre-order Sarah's book and Justin's book from our bookstore, New and Books. And we'll be putting all the details in the chat box. Please put in some Q&A. Sarah and Justin are going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, 50 minutes maybe, and then we'll take questions. And I'm sure you will have a lot because you're always a wonderful audience. So no more from me. I'm handing you over to Justin and enjoy yourselves. Uh, thank you hugely for that. It's a real honor to be doing this. It genuinely is. It's nice of you to mention my book where we're here very much to discuss Sarah's, which is um, frankly a book that is um, hugely timely for perfectly obvious reasons, somewhat depressing. Um, uh, and I want to talk to Sarah about that uh, and have a conversation that just doesn't say, woe is us, what on earth has happened to the place, it's all over, but also looks potentially at how America can be rescued from the um, uh, situation that it's, that it's in. But it's also, I mean, this is just wonderfully, wonderfully, uh, brilliantly written actually it's gripping uh, it's full of stories and and anecdotes and the best kind of history which just pulls you in it teaches you a lot without you ever thinking that you're being taught and and lectured um so um the wrath to come is a, is a wonderful book i've had the pleasure of reading it never mind what the, what it has on the cover what is between the covers uh is absolutely fantastic and it's a real pleasure to talk to um sarah now about it so sarah if you uh, are there? Yes, there she is. Wonderful, wonderful. You're switched on and, and you're with us. Um, congratulations, first of all. It, it is an extraordinary book. Did, did tell us first how you got the idea, because as 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 we were being told, it's 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 about Gone with the Wind. It's also about the modern age, very much about both. Where where did it? Were you sitting in the bath and suddenly thought, whoa, <laughs> hang on a second, there's an obvious thing going on there, or or what? Uh, no, not quite like that, sadly. I don't, I don't have ideas in the bath. <laughs> I'm not your um, I, um, Look, I grew up with Gone with the Wind. I was obsessed with it as a child. I loved the movie. 
Uh, I thought it was fabulous. I played Barbie dolls with like dressing up with the Scarlet O'Hara and stuff. So Gone with the Wind has always been in my head. And um, and so it's kind of, um, it's part of my, like my lingua franca. So as the events in America were unfolding and I'm thinking particularly about the, um, uh, as the controversies that began to erupt um, uh, as Trump became, as, as Trump's administration started um, around the taking down of Confederate statues, of course, very analogous to, this, to the debates that happened over here about the same questions about taking down statues of, um, of um, imperialists and white supremacists. And um, everybody on this call will remember um, in 2017, the, um, the, the riots and protests at Charlottesville around the removal of Robert E. Lee's statue. Um, and that led Donald Trump, um, who was still you know, a fairly new president at that point, it was August, 2017, about six months into his presidency, um, to say that there were very fine people on both sides of the, of the fight, even though one side of the fight were shouting, Jews will not replace us and shouting blood and soil and were literally neo-Nazis and literally Klansmen. And it shocked the world, right? And I started saying at that point, if you want to understand the debates about these Confederate statues and kind of what's happening, it, it's it's a story that gets told through Gone with the Wind. And it was a kind of shorthand that people could recognize. So I actually started talking about it in those terms at that point and started thinking about this book. But I thought it would be a short book where I would just kind of give a little overview about it. But then over the last five years, basically American history keeps rolling back to the story and it keeps so as I as I tried to write what was supposed to be a compact book it kept expanding in front of me until we got to the point of the insurrection of January 6th last year where the confederate flag was carried into the capital and it was as if that this kind of I, I don't want to call myself prophetic because I'm not but it was just an intuition that's, that's the right word for it this intuition that I'd had that gone with the wind was the key to what was happening and was a way to talk us through what was happening um, kept getting truer and truer as history galloped forward um, and, and, and kept carrying Gone with the Wind back into the frame and into the narrative. And over the last years, Gone with the Wind's been everywhere. Um, and, I, and I felt that it was just being used as a shorthand. I actually sat down and rewrote the book. I wrote the book a bunch of times as a result of this and kind of didn't know when to finish it because it kept going and going. <laughs> um, but the, but the, the, the people use it as a shorthand. And what I wanted to do is to say, it's not just a superficial gesture to the romantic ideas of the Civil War. There's much, much, much more going on here. And what we need to do is a forensic examination of the facts of history versus the myth that is embodied by Gone with the Wind and see what putting those into conflict with each other teaches us about America. And that's what I tried to do in the book. And the importance of the myth in, in the modern age. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things that I'm trying to do in the book is to say, this isn't, only history. It is history. And I tried to do history to the best of my ability to make sure that everything is documented, that everything is stood up. There's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of footnotes in this book, hopefully not obtrusive, hopefully I made it readable, but it is documented because it has to be. There can't be any question about the factuality of what I'm talking about here, but it's not strictly history and it's not solely history because what I also wanted to do was to show what thinking about stories and myth-making adds to our understanding of the situation that we find ourselves in. And, and what I argue in the book, as you know, is that what I think that Gone with the Wind adds by doing putting both together and, and kind of letting them, like it's a catalyst, right? It's a, it's a chemistry experiment, see what happens when you put the two together. And that what that does is, it, is, is what the storytelling, the film and the novel give us is the emotions. They give us the imagination. They give us the collective psychology. They give us the, the, the motive behind the denial. They give us all of the motivations. They give us the, um, the desire, what's driving all of it. So the history tells you what happened, but often what happens with storytelling and myth-making is it tells you why it happened and on a human level, where people were coming from and what was motivating all of this. And so my hope and my kind of plan was that putting those together would give you a much fuller picture of how this could happen and why it happened. The why really interests me because it, it, are you saying that America is peculiar in, I mean, obviously there are peculiar- Exceptional even? Our, exceptionally, <laughs> yes, in that. There obviously are exceptional aspects of America and particularly when it comes to slavery, but is the myth-making as well and the, the, the desire among a large segment of the population to believe a myth and to be consumed by it, is, is that also a peculiarly American thing? 
I certainly think it's at the heart of who we are. I don't want to claim it's you know unique to human history or anything. Um, and Americans do like to kind of you know claim that that level of exceptionalism. But but I would flip it around and say it is fundamental to American identity, absolutely. And and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. People, you know, I've lived in in Britain now for for over twenty years, and and uh, you know Europeans and 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 the British um, may or may not be the same people. Um, often um, are, are taken aback by it and will criticize uh, Americans' um, fetishization of our founding documents. So the ways in which this kind of mm. commitment to and fidelity to these 18th century documents, you know, keeps getting us into trouble. But those, the, the, what that does, that, that, that sense that those, that, those, that those documents and those stories and those arguments and claims are at the heart of who we are, means that for good or ill, like it or loathe it, it's a fact that story shapes who Americans are and it's at the it's at the foundation it's narrative a series of narratives are at the heart of how Americans understand themselves and that lends itself to myth making that becomes myth making very very quickly and gone with the wind is one of our most powerful myths it's by no means our only myth and you alluded to some of the other ones you know um uh, in, in the introduction but um but the but but it is one of the it is one of the key ones and and I think that we are Put it, put it. I would say we're we're probably more susceptible to myth making than a lot of other cultures. Mm. Why is that? Well, because I think we need the myths to hold us together. Because we are the size of Europe, we are a continent with a hugely diverse population, and we are no more united than all of Europe is united. I mean, we see the way that even the EU within that there, of course, there are conflicts. That's part of the reason why British people wanted to leave it. Those who did, right, because they didn't see the EU as a functioning political system. Um, and we don't have to argue the, the pros and cons of that. Obviously, that's for another time. But um, but I just think that the comparator is important for Europeans to remember is that when we talk about the United States, we're talking about a landmass and a population that is equivalent to Europe, not Britain or France or any of the nations of Europe. So it's hugely disparate. The cultures are disparate. Religion is disparate. Languages are disparate. And, and so, you know, um, I've said for a long time, and I think I put it in the book, that any country that calls itself the United States is protesting too much. Um, you know, we're trying to convince ourselves in the world that we're united. We've never been united. <laughs> that, it's like, it, that's the project, right? I mean, the Constitution, the preamble to the Constitution is in order to form a in order to form a more perfect union. So this sense of union formation, but that it's this process that has to be going. We've never been united. We keep trying to see if we can get united. Um, and it hasn't happened yet, but storytelling is at the heart of any attempt to unite a people. And again, we've seen that in Britain. Anybody who lives here has seen how storytelling is, is dividing and uniting communities and then creating dividing lines. And that's yeah. that's at the heart of, of American identity. Because when you're talking now, you put in, me in mind of I think is it Kurt Anderson who wrote a fantastic mm. book called Fantasyland a year or two ago in which he he tried as well to answer that question and he came up with Buffalo Bill mm. as an example so Buffalo Bill is both a real person but who, who actually fought uh, Native Americans but also then of course had him in his had them in his show uh, and sometimes the we same do love ones, a show. <laughs> the same ones that had tried to fight, and and then they all got mixed up, and some, you know, and it was a show, and then he went back to fighting them, and then he went back to a show. And I, I Kurt Anderson, I can't remember the details of the book, but it, it, it's Kurt Anderson's point is, which I think is so relevant to yours, that there is something exactly as you say, there's something that needs to happen in America in order to pull it together, that 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 creates these really really powerful myths and is a little bit um, lax, to put it mildly, about truth and reality when it, when it comes to sort of mixing them up in society. But also then, of course, mixed in with that, the thing that we have now, which is Americans' increasing desire, permission that they give themselves to believe absolutely what the heck they like, like about anything. And that, absolutely. I mean, that strikes me as such an important part in a sense of of your book because it's been there as a myth but now it's just yeah. exploding because you can yeah. really believe if you want to believe that there are good people on both sides the hell yeah. you can go ahead and do it exactly and so and i think that's exactly the problem and as you say that's one of the things that the book is really trying to get to grips with and to and to examine is and to try to understand because um it seems to me that the that 
one of the problems with lying about your own history, and, and you know, the subtitle of the book is The Lies America Tells for a Reason. It's not just one set of lies, and it's not just about slavery. It's, there's a whole set of lies that I'm trying to get at here in a series of lies, really. Um, and it's about suppression of the truth about slavery and the aftermath of slavery and Jim Crow and American fascism, which was also a real thing, which has been completely suppressed, something that we don't talk about at all. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that has led to debates about whether you can even talk about Donald Trump and his administration as fascist because part of the American exceptionalist argument is that America was also an exception that never had a fascist movement. Well, it absolutely did. That is historically incorrect. They self-identified as fascists in the interwar period. We had fascists, right? They were like, hello, I'm a fascist. So we had them, they were there, um, right? And, and it's thinking about the consequences of that. Um, and so I think that the, um, the, 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 the cost of this kind of denialism of lying at, at a wholesale level about your own past is that the past, what really did happen in the past reality continues to have consequences in the present. It does have consequences. It has knock on effects. And if you don't know what happened, you're just constantly bewildered by those knock on effects. And, and violence erupts because the, because the story ceases to make sense of the reality. So you have the story that you tell yourself and then there's all of this violence around you and and the stories aren't making sense of that anymore. But it turns out that if you go back and look at what really happened, it all makes perfect sense. And suddenly you go, oh, that's why that's happening. So as you say, it's in one sense, a deeply depressing story. But for me, one of the things that is, I hope, um, on the positive side of the ledger of reading, it certainly was on the positive side of the ledger for me of writing it is, that I hope it's enlightening and, and that that's where the positive comes from is that is that for me, as I, as I dug deep into this history and tried to make sense of it, I realized I wasn't bewildered anymore. I'm gonna be horrified anyway, but I'd much rather be horrified and understand why I'm horrified than be horrified and, and, and totally confused about what the hell is going on and why it's happening. Can and that's not, where the lies come in. Can you not also make the case though that the United States for all its massive faults and for all this kind of utter craziness about its history and for all the gone with the wind um, uh, denialism actually has, you know, never mind, put Trump to one side for, for a second, but actually has. <laughs> Let's put him to one side for as long as <laughs> yeah. possible. <laughs> I admit that he's still a rather large elephant in the room, but let's, let's put him to one side for a second. Since the, I don't know, since, well, since Gone with the Wind, actually, since, since the 30s, um, there has been real progress. And if you look around the world at the way that racism is in, in other countries, there is a story that can be told about America um, uh, on the race front and also on, on other fronts as well that says you know, it, hasn't, um, it, it hasn't resolved these things, but um, yeah, you've had a black president. You've, you've, you've thought about this stuff. You still discuss it hugely. And, and all of those things are on, are on the positive side. Mm, absolutely. That's certainly what I believed through Obama's presidency. And I haven't rejected that entirely. I still think that's part of the story. But and I don't know what the outcome will be. Look, I'm an American, so I'm eternally optimistic anyway, you know, and we're all bought into this. So, um, but no, of course, you're right. And and this is crucial, right? I'm not. I I think that America is a story of three steps forward and two steps back. And we're in a two steps back phase, for sure. So I'm telling a story about the two steps back part of it and saying this is what the backlash looks like. This is what the regression looks like. This is what reactionary politics is and why it is but it's in reaction to progress. It's in reaction to real racial progress. And every time that, uh, that, that black Americans and women make real political gains, then the forces of reactionary America push back. And of course, we're seeing that um, at the moment much more actively around the questions of women's rights and bodily autonomy, you know, as obviously the, the biggest uh, um, story this very moment, but it's all bound up with, with the questions around Black Lives Matter as well, because it's about whether the United States will ever be a full multiracial democracy, a full democracy in which all of its citizens, as the 14th Amendment guarantees, which was passed in the wake of the Civil War in 1868, that was the amendment that said that all Americans have birthright citizenship and are fully equal under the law and fully entitled to due process. Now that amendment has never been realized the same way that the constitution and the declaration's promises of freedom and liberty and justice have never been realized. But that's why I think that it's, it's I always think that it's not only okay, but good to a certain, yes, there are there are drawbacks to it, 
But when we fetishize those documents, it means we're fetishizing those ideals. And I do not repudiate those ideals. And what I think that they did was despite themselves, they created the conditions for more democracy than they ever intended. And, and so that one of the most extraordinary aspects of American history, I think, is, is really kind of where my story starts historically, which is the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. And you, you, the, the, the glass half full, as you're suggesting, the kind of the, the positive take on this story is we can pause and think for a moment about the fact that this is a nation that tried to go from race-based human slavery to a full multiracial democracy in the space of five years. And I'm really proud of that. Like I'm like mm. audacious, you know, good for mm. you guys. Totally failed, right? Totally, entirely failed. But mm. good for us for trying, you know. And and the point is, is that we keep trying. The point is, is that we keep coming back and trying, and and we keep rededicating ourselves to the proposition that Lincoln stated in the Gettysburg Address, that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. And we believe, some of us believe in that, and some of us continue to fight for it. So yes, it's three steps forward, two steps back. But in order to understand the backlash, I think you have to understand the history. And then the backlash becomes less bewildering. And then I think we also understand what the battle is that we're engaged in. It's on, also on the principle of know your enemy and know what this fight is about and what it is, what its stakes are, how high the stakes are. Do not underestimate the stakes of this battle. Do not underestimate the cost of this battle, but do not underestimate the importance of this battle. And therefore, that's why I think we have to stay engaged in it. And I hope that my book is in that sense a battle cry. I want it to be one. It certainly is for me to remind myself of why I can't just give up and why I can't put Donald Trump to one side, but why I have to stay in the fight. Yeah, I'll get to, to, to we'll bring him back into the picture in a moment. He is let's part of the on, story, unfortunately. Let's keep him on one side for a moment. Can I bring up someone else, the philosopher Richard Rorty, mm. who I, I've always really enjoyed his books. And he wrote a fantastic book called Achieving Our Country, which is a, a, a quote from Baldwin, I think, isn't it? About, mm. about. Um, so is my title, I should say, the rest yeah, of it is which also of course from Baldwin. Yeah. As well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, but he, please, he please, has, I didn't mean to cut you off. He has quotable, he has quotable yeah. things. The Rorty, no, I could write. <laughs> so Rorty, the great philosopher um, on the left in American politics, dead now, sadly, but one of the points that he made was that on the, the, the socially progressive side of America, you've got to be really careful that you bring people with you, that there is, um, that you don't become unpatriotic and you don't completely deny the things that are not good about America in that kind of rather trite way, but the fundamental aims of America, however they haven't been met, that are actually decent and, and, and a proper lesson to humanity. And, and what Rorty suggested writing, I don't know, a decade or so ago, was that he was worried that, that people on the socially progressive left in America were beginning to deny everything, you know, the whole thing, just chuck it out. Uh, all the myths, everything. Do, do you do you see a problem there, or, or I mean, where? Because you've written a kind of book that Rorty would have been fascinated by, I think. And I don't think you do chuck out everything, but it's a danger, isn't it? It is a danger, and I think you're right. And I do see it, um, particularly with young people with with university students, where they say things like, "Well, you know, I I, I don't want to um, I don't want to talk about this democracy and justice stuff because they were enslavers, you know, because Jefferson and Washington were enslavers." Like, yes, mm -hmm. they were. So that means that we reject them, but does that mean that we reject the principles that they espoused? And do we say that just because we don't like the people who espouse them, that the principles aren't worth upholding? And I think there's a very, very important distinction to make there. I still think democracy is better than all of the alternatives. Um, and I absolutely agree with you that the that it, it's the the mistake I think that we made that that my generation made, um, and and that I think the generations after me um, have made is that is that I grew up thinking democracy had been achieved. I really did. I thought we were there. I didn't understand that it was an ongoing struggle and that it would always be an ongoing struggle. I didn't understand how power worked. I didn't, I was really naive. 
in a way that only I think Americans, only rich Americans can be naive. I was, I was that kind of naive rich white American who was like, yay, this is all great. Um, and, and so it has been a wake up call uh, uh, for me and, and for a lot of my generation, but, but to realize that it's always a process and that, the, and that it's never achieved. It's always about trying to form something that is more perfect because humanity isn't perfect. We're never gonna get there. But, it, but the whole point is to keep trying. And the whole point is to say we can do better and we can keep doing better. And the emphasis in America on, in, in, in these kind of national myths, I mean, um, on that idea of, it is an idealized project. Um, and there is still something beautiful about that. And, and what I, what Trumpism taught me personally as an individual, watching his administration and actually watching the January 6th hearings and the way that the people who supported him are, are the ways that they talk about what happened then, is that, and I actually wrote this in my previous book, but, but it's, um, it has become truer than I think I understood when I wrote it then, which is that if you, if you throw out higher ideals thinking that they're naive, you're only left with lower ideals. And all you've got is the lowest common denominator and that's just corruption. Then you've just got that you've just given up. So I, I think it's binary. You know, we either accept that everybody's corrupt and we don't even try, but I don't think it's true actually. I think that that's the story that the corrupt would like us to tell so that they can get away with their corruption. But I don't think everybody is corrupt. And I think that there are a lot of people operating in very good faith to try to create a more just and more equal and freer society. And, um, and it's about whether, whether we are going to put our shoulders to the wheel of that project. Yeah. There's a fascinating bit of the book that um, going back to the book itself, that um, put me in mind, not of Donald Trump, but of Liz Truss, actually, another um, uh, mm -hmm. significant figure in all our minds at the moment. That's um, not a comparison I expect. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mention her by name, I hasten to add. Uh, you're, you're not that perceptive, but, or, or maybe you just didn't want to go there. But <laughs> one, of, one of the things she is, uh, she, I, I hesitate to use the word famous for, one of the things she said recently, she was, she was annoyed about the sexism implicit in the idea that men are, are the only people capable of, of wars and awful things and women kind of always settle them and, and if, if the whole world was left to women would all be would all be fine it really struck me actually there's a whole I can't remember where it is but there's a section of your book which is fascinating about the way in which women drove some of the cruelest parts of, of what went on with lynchings but actually of course you know you think of prominent women in American politics at, at the moment um, uh, they're there aren't they they always have been exactly, and they're white women for the most part. Now, now we have prominent black women in politics, of course, within the story that I tell um, politically at the beginning. So when um, when black people were given the vote after the Civil War, it was specifically in the Fifteenth Amendment only black males who were given the vote, and black women were excluded from the vote. And um, and so black women did not have a political role because they had been denied a political role, or you know, an act, you know, formal political role. Of course, they were political on the ground. Um, but um, they were denied that formal political role until American women were given the vote in 1920. And even then they were excluded from politics in practice throughout much of the country until very recently. So now we're looking at a fuller picture where obviously there are these great activist African-American women like Stacey Abrams in Georgia, um, who very much you know, personally helped tilt the Georgia Senate um, uh, and, and gave Biden his you know, wafer thin majority that he, um, that he has in Congress and indeed it was African-American women in South Carolina who gave Biden the primary um, in the first place. So it's African-American women, political activists who have been, who have been driving the, the resistance um, to Trump. But as you were implying, there are also very prominent white American women who are uh, supporting Trump. And we can think of, uh, of junior uh, Congresswomen like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Biebert, you know, these very uh, um, prominent figures, um, very divisive but also uh, Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court, for example, and the role that she has taken in overturning Roe v. Wade. So there are these very, very prominent women who are working um, with the forces of, um, mm. of what I would call you know, authoritarian uh, um, patriarchy. <laughs> um, but exactly to the point. So one of the things that I, that I was working on here is that the, um, and the stories that I wanted to tell were that um, the, um, the kind of the mythology around American slavery is that, and this is a very self-serving story for white women, is that um, 
uh, white women were almost as oppressed as enslaved people were because of patriarchy. White men had all of the power, the story goes, and white women, because they couldn't own property in their own right, um, you know, like as in Victorian Britain, because of the laws of so-called coverture, right, which meant that men could hold land and, and you know, money and women couldn't, and they couldn't, you know, sign contracts in their own name, et cetera. Um, and that's, that was the story I inherited. That was the story that I believed for a really long time. And, um, and a lot of, uh, of white women historians have believed that for a long time and, um, and have looked at the ways that certainly understanding that white women were, were cruel within um, chattel slavery, that's not news, um, but the, that cruelty was understood to be indirect and oblique and to be manipulative and to be finding its way through these back channels. It turns out that's wrong and it turns it's flatly wrong. And it turns out that it was um, historic women of color uh, who were historians who went back into the record and were like, uh-uh, that is not how it happened. And it turns out that in fact, uh, white women had more power under chattel slavery than they had in any other political or legal or economic system in the United States, because human property was the only kind of property that they were allowed to hold in their own name, to bequeath, to sell. And so they couldn't do that with land and they couldn't do it with cash, but they could do it with human beings. And so white women slaveholders lost more in the aftermath of the Civil War, arguably, than the white men did because the white men could reclaim their power and their money in other ways, but the white women couldn't. And that, I think, drove an enormous amount of the immediate aftermath of the, uh, of the t politics of racial terror that drove um, the second half of the 19th century. Grievance, spite, they were pissed off. <laughs> Do you when when we sort of turn you your um your final chapter actually your final paragraph has a kind of great Gatsby esque uh, I had to <laughs> <laughs> and it's wonderful and it it kind of it well, thank just, you. it is it's got this this sense of of number one pressing on uh, but number two the the act of pressing on itself being being an act of, of foolishness and, and delusion. How, how, you know, how, how does America press on now politically? That's a rather big question, but I just, when you look at what's going on at the moment, it fascinates us. You look at the Democrats and they're obviously in many respects all at sea. Um, what, 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 what happens over the next year or two that might set things on a, on a fairer course, do you think? Well, it is, as you say, a very big question, and um, and I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, having having tried to reclaim my optimism um, to a certain extent, I will say I think you know. I mean, it's clear to me. I don't think I know. American democracy is teetering on an, on a knife edge, and the the you know, we have we have a rogue activist Supreme Court, overreaching certainly more than any court since um, since the Taney Court, which uh, helped. This, don't have to go into too much detail about American history here, but that that helped was what was a proximate cause of the Civil War um, in in the 1850s. Um, but is um, is is usurping the the legislative process? They're writing laws, um, and and I can say that with absolute confidence because Gorsuch, who is one of the right wing judges, in a dissent that he wrote to one of the decisions that they made in the session at the end of June, he said that. In his dissent, and he's one of the ones signing on for the overturning of Roe. He's one of the right-wing judges who has been signing on for some of this, and he said, with one uh, decision that they that he d differed on, that he dissented from, he said this court is usurping the legislative process. And I said, in reading his dissent, this is true of every single thing that you guys are doing. They are, and so I don't know how we redress that because we have never had a rogue Supreme Court before. It's a real problem. Um, so we have a, a, a legislature that is um, that is uh, uh, in a in a gridlock, in an absolute gridlock. Um, we have uh, it's being held hostage to a minority viewpoint on the right. Um, we have a um, we have, as you say, uh, um, supposed Democrats who are uh, you know who are voting <laughs> with the Republicans more often than not. So so there's this you know stranglehold there, and the Democrats. There's a problem of gerontocracy in the Democrat yeah. power structure. There is a big problem mm -hmm. with gerontocracy and with them not relinquishing power or bringing in the next generation with creating lines of succession. We have 80 year old, 85 year old, 90 year old senators who are clutching on to power. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. 
right? So that's the legislative branch. So it's not functioning. And then the executive branch, everybody's saying, well, why isn't Biden doing anything? And Biden isn't doing anything, partly because the, the system is, is, is kind of grinding to a halt, partly because he doesn't have, everybody's like, oh, he was supposed to be an FDR. Well, he doesn't have FDR's Congress. FDR had a whomping majority in Congress and FDR could pass whatever FDR wanted to pass. And he had a majority, you know, for, for British listeners, I would say, you know, think about Johnson's majority when he came into to Parliament, um, where it was just a mandate and FDR had that kind of, of majority, but also Biden doesn't do it because Biden believes in the system and he believes that there that that actually Congress is supposed to bring him laws and he is not supposed to just be issuing executive orders, and and so I think he's like the stalwart you know old guard who's like come on guys write a law and I'll pass it, um, but um, but but you know the the so how we get ourselves out of this mess. Um, I don't know. And I think the real question is going to be how much the uh, Supreme Court overreach and how much the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the um, Dobbs decision, how much that activates uh, white women uh, across the political spectrum and white men, because of course men are affected by, uh, by the uh, reversal of reproductive autonomy as well. And we're already seeing horror stories about, um, about women who are being put through trauma and, and, um, and, and whose lives are being risked and lost uh, because of these insane court decisions. So that affects men, it affects children, it affects everybody, right? So um, so we have to see how much that uh, uh, catalyzes the electorate. Um, and, and I think we just don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And the polls are RFE and just to see. But, um, but it's a real problem. We still have 70 million Americans who think that Biden isn't the legitimate president and who believe that Trump won the last election. Um, and we have Trump saying that he's going to run and he's going to run to try to avoid being prosecuted for the armed sedition that he led. That's a problem, <laughs> right? I mean, and if so, we're gonna have a presidential candidate who tried to lead an armed insurrection against the country and we're gonna have a media that is refusing to say that that's what's happening. But also you've got a, a, an actual president who's not capable of standing up to all of that, I think is, is the feeling, isn't it? Among Well, it I, seems to be by polling actually, I, the feeling yeah, among the majority I, of Democrats. He is certainly not standing up to it at present. And I think that the the it, it is the, the thing that always worried me the most about Biden is that is that uh, he he still thinks that Mitch McConnell is his friend because Mitch McConnell came to his son's funeral. But, you know, Mitch McConnell is going to his son's funeral and then stabbing everything that Biden believes, you know, he's, he's setting it up, you know, setting a bonfire to it. But, but um, you know, Biden's decency is holding him back here. He can't see the ruthlessness of what he's facing. But does a, ruthless, a does a ruthless uh, Democratic leader, for future president, assuming someone can get themselves elected, do they then, oh, have we reached a stage now where they need to kind of take a blowtorch to all those constitutional things you were talking about earlier on? Well, one thing they could do without affecting the constitution at all, of course, is pack the Supreme Court. I mean, is, are, are we are we getting towards that that degree of of kind of um, conflict actually? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know, look, one of the things that happened across nineteenth century history that has been kind of lost to sight is that so we've got this idea that that the that the the system that we grew up with and that we're familiar with is kind of you know twas ever thus. It's simply not true, and it was in wild flux throughout the nineteenth century partly because of the expansion of the continental US. It meant that new states were constantly being admitted, which constantly changed the political calculus mm -hmm. in ways that were really complicated, but are really, really um, uh, influential and consequential for the way that United States history unfolded. And indeed the civil war was caused by westward expansion. That was one of the proximate causes. It was not that the, that the North and South got to a point where they just were having this fight. It was what activated the fight was about what would happen when new states came into the union. So. The, whether they would be free or, or slave states, right? So the, 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 that and, and the number of Supreme Court justices throughout the 19th century fluctuated. So it was not set in stone that it was nine. It is not stated in the constitution that it has to be nine. So we have in the past had different numbers. There's no reason why we couldn't have different numbers now if the political will were there. The problem is, is, that, is that we've got this knife edge congressional uh, um, division. We need a proper majority and I don't know that we're going to get one. Now we might, as I say, it may be that the that the, the backlash against what's happened is sufficient to ignite, to ignite um, not just Democrats, but to get Republicans who have been voting, you know, kind of holding their nose and voting for Trump because it would give them what they wanted who suddenly understand the consequences um, of what they're seeing. But I simply don't know. I think that we have to understand that the, um, how many, that the story that we tell about it being, you know, the poor left behind white working class who, who 
uh, who carried Trump. It's not true. The, the poor, poor white people voted overwhelmingly for uh, Hillary Clinton and for Biden and, and the real poor people in America, of course, are black people, um, uh, again, overwhelmingly voted for uh, for Clinton and, and for Biden. Um, Trump is a phenomenon of middle class and rich white people. And, and I think it's really important that that be said. So a lot of them voted for him because of the tax breaks and because of their pension. And now they've discovered that they've just been stripped of their reproductive rights. So the, that's the class I want to, that's I want to see what happens with those people. And they are scattered around the country in a way that can tip the electoral college balance. So one question is, can we pack the Supreme Court? One question is, can we tip the electoral college balance, not by rewriting the electoral college, but by demographic movement? One of the unintended consequences of the pandemic is working from home and being able to work remotely means that educated progressive young people are moving across the country in the last couple of years since lockdown in unprecedented waves, going home, buying up land cheap where they grew up and repopulating red states. Now that's interesting. And that again can change the political calculus. The other thing that could massively change the political calculus, but again would take a majority in Congress to do it is making Washington DC a state, which it should be because it doesn't send representatives to Congress because it's the District of Columbia, so it's this weird anomaly and it shouldn't be, um, but um, it is. So DC um, overwhelmingly wants statehood. The residents of DC want statehood because of course uh, we fought a little revolution on the, on the principle of no taxation without representation and the residents of Washington DC uh, pay taxes and they do not have political representation. They're annoyed about it, rightly so. And of course the other is giving statehood to Puerto Rico. We could get statehood for Puerto Rico and Washington DC. Again, the whole political map changes, the electoral college map changes everything changes. So there are various levers that we could pull. All of them require congressional majority, all of them require a mandate, and all of them require quite a lot of boldness at the top to set that legislative agenda. And that's what we're not seeing from the gerontocracy right now. Yeah. And, and just to make clear on the gerontocracy, I was reading the other day, I think this is right, that if you had a, a cutoff of, of the age of 70, Something like seventy-one percent of Congress wouldn't wouldn't be there, which is they are isn't so it? old. I mean, it's just so old. They are so old, and there's a kind of running joke about my generation because I'm Gen X, right? I'm squarely Gen X, and now it's like this fight between boomers, where my parents' generation, and uh, Gen Z, right? And the Gen Xers are all like, "No, no." <laughs> 50 somethings, we would be okay. <laughs> Give us a shot. <laughs> We're old enough, wise enough. We actually know how the world works. And it's as if we just got wiped out of political existence. Now, again, as I say, you know, I said this at the beginning, I, I partly blame us because we were complacent and we took our politics for granted. Um, but, but you know, now we're kind of here and ready. And there's this sense in which the boomers are gonna hand over. So the boomers are gonna hand off to the AOCs of the world. And, and I say this not in terms of, um, you know, a, a sense of ownership or entitlement or anything, but that actually, I think that that succession of generations is a socially healthy thing to do. And we have created a system that isn't doing it where, where, where the parental generation, the older generation is not handing off to the next generation, is not stepping aside the way that it should be and they're clinging on to power. The other thing I always point out to people, right? Bear in mind, if you wanna think about, if you wanna understand American politics, bear in mind that Nancy Pelosi, who I'm broadly okay with, I mean, she's better than the opposition, um, but, and she's, you know, canny. She has not, never broken the law that I'm aware of. She's, she's not considered a corrupt politician. She is worth $300 million at a conservative estimate just by serving in Congress legally. They have all enriched themselves and that is partly why they are not giving up the reins of power. Now also they are not giving up the reins of power because people like power once they get it. Um, but yeah, we need a system by which they, they step aside. We need um, an understanding by which they step aside or we need some laws whereby they have to step aside. Yeah. Chuck, Chuck Grassley, who's a Republican, <laughs> has been a Senator since 1980. <laughs> I interviewed him uh, in about 2004, I guess it was. And yeah, he was a, he was a, he was a an venerable, old man then. <laughs> a venerable old man, very charming, exactly as you'd expect a senator to be. And, and yeah, he's still there. It he's is absolutely there. amazing. Amazing. Okay, let's go to questions, um, Sarah, of, of which there are quite a few that have come in. And actually, one of them very much goes to this business of myth making. But I suppose the extent to which this myth-making is a uniquely American thing. So this person says, how does American myth-making compare with the British version, the benign empire, hearts of oak, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, if you were David Olashoga or someone, you'd, 
you'd be saying, hang on a second, I think we've got some some myths of our own. What 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 yeah. what where do the comparisons, where are the comparisons useful and where are they not? Yeah. Um, so we inherited our sense of exceptionalism and our sense of inherent innocence and our sense of uh, um, uh, self-righteousness, for want of a, of a kinder word, uh, from you. <laughs> so we inherited it directly well. um, and we repurposed it, we adapted it, we made it our own. I think we've owned it. I think it's a good look on us. I think we mm. fully embraced it, um, but it definitely comes by it, you guys. And, um, and, and I say that that's not facetious and it's also demonstrable. Um, so when we had our uh, debates uh, around the revolution, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson and Washington, the revolutionary generation justified the revolution on the basis of British exceptionalism <laughs> and did so saying we're Englishmen. And because we're Englishmen, because of the Saxon constitution, we are yeah. innately free. And therefore, and so basically they just replicated the, the arguments about constitutional monarchy from a century earlier and said, we have the same entitlements as Anglo-Saxons to be an inherently free people. Um, and so, and that carries through, right? And so the, 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 um, that sense that, and, and of course the, the, the imperial project uh, was the, the, the intertwining of, um, of America and Britain throughout the 19th century and in, in these economic and political and racial projects cannot be overstated, right? I mean, what, you know, the reason why Cecil Rhodes so much debated here, um, why, why did he set up the famous Rhodes Scholarships? He set up the famous Rhodes Scholarships because he thought the United States should never have split from Britain because he thought that all Anglo-Saxon people should stick together. And he wanted the right, white ruling class to get back together. So mm. he wanted white Americans to come over to Oxford and become white ruling class people again because the Anglo-Saxons needed to run the world. And there were a lot of Americans who were completely signing up for that, right? So yeah, we got it from you. Same thing. We just have our own version of it. Yeah. But does it particularly go to slavery? Because I mean, we have our own version of our our involvement in slavery, which broadly speaking, certainly what I was taught at school, is that we abolished it. Uh, we didn't do much with it. And then we we realized yeah. it was a bad thing and we got rid of it. And actually, when yeah. you, and again, David also, or other people as well, where you realize that actually it wasn't quite like, like well, that. Quite like that. No, 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 a little harder than that. And mm -hmm. um, and so the um, there's a, I'm going to forget who it was. I think it was maybe Eric Williams, but one of the great um, West Indian post-colonial, maybe CLR James, um, but um, one of the great historians of slavery and post-colonialism um, in the mid-century um, quipped uh, that um, the way the British talk about slavery, you, you would be forgiven for thinking that they invented it in order to abolish it, um, <laughs> which yeah. I think is, is true in my experience, right? So you invented the modern forms of it. And look, the triangle trade, I mean, for heaven's sake, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the trade between Liverpool uh, and the other slave ports and the United States. We're talking about the role that Britain had in the Civil War because it didn't want to lose its cotton. Um, the, the, the way that, that slave uh, um, um, picked cotton, that, that, which kept the prices low, drove the Industrial Revolution. I mean, there's something I have, I have I, I can't do the statistics off the top of my head, but it's in the book. The degree to which the Industrial Revolution was dependent on, on the export of slave, of, yeah. of enslaved laborer um, picked cotton, right? So the whole thing is is totally entangled. And and you know what I tend to say about the British relationship to slavery is you offshored it, um, mm. and um, you know we kept ours in house, and then you offshored yours. Mm. And um, and uh, but you know and, and so you could keep your your hands a little bit cleaner. But it's Pontius Pilate time, you know. And and so the but the the profits. The point is is that both systems pro pocketed the profits. Yeah. And that drove our uh, our social prerogatives, our political and economic prerogatives throughout the 19th century and through the 20th century. And so there's been some, you know, shift and, and movement between the US and, and, um, and the UK for dominance over that. But the, but the imperial project in broad terms is fundamentally the same, but of course it plays out very differently according to the different histories. Okay, new question. Um, does America tell particular lies about climate change is, mm -hmm. is the question. I'm so glad you asked that. I had a, I do have a passing reference to that in the book because I thought it was important enough. And of course, the, the 30s, we've been talking about the um, Civil War era and today, but a, but a really important part of the book is also the history of the 1930s, um, mm. because of course that's when Gone with the Wind came out, both the book and the film. And that is when uh, um, the Great Depression was exacerbated by the so-called Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl, which was a drought um, in which the heartland kind of collapsed, um, 
was a, an early harbinger of climate change. They didn't understand that. So they weren't in denial about that. They didn't yet have the science to show it. Um, they were certainly in denial about the fact that overfarming had contributed to it. They knew, they certainly knew enough to know that. Um, and, um, and certainly in denial about the, the effects that it was having um, on American society um, and treating it as a one-off instead of as, um, as, as a kind of self-inflicted um, problem. But it is embedded in the story and, um, and the story of, um, of dwindling resources, the story of self-immolation um, writ large. Of, um, America, America's denialism absolutely continues through its relationship to climate change. And as you said at the beginning, Justin, I mean, we continue to be a society that thinks it can tell itself whatever it wants to about, and you know that it can just make facts what it wants them to be, and that that's part of, of you know, so, so we can just make it all go away. You know, wishful yeah. thinking will be powerful enough. So, well, and um, yeah, and it may be that climate change is the one that tilts the balance, and that that's that the that the democratic politics of America cease to, to matter a damn because the world is on fire. On the subject of making things up as you as you go along, another question about that, specifically wanting you to talk about online groups and, and myth making, QAnon and all that kind of kind of stuff. What, what what is going on and what is people are turning now, aren't they, to the idea of what to do about disinformation and people's widespread adherence to things that are simply not true. Do, do you, and obviously just combating it with facts doesn't work. What, what, no. what is the, the solution or where are the solutions to be found? Yeah, I mean, look, if I knew the solutions, I, that's what I would have written my book about. <laughs> and I would be like, here we have it. I know, I know how to fix it. Uh, let's get on with it. Um, I don't know exactly. I mean, I certainly don't know at all how to fix it in one sense. Um, but obviously what we need to do is to repair trust in, in, uh, in sources of information. Um, I always think that, you know, Wikipedia is a really interesting example, right? Because um, for those of us who are old enough to remember when Wikipedia started, um, it was it was a morass of nonsense for a while. It became this absolute, it was mayhem and people could, because the original, the original, it was a utopian, it was a utopian online idea that Jimmy Wales had that, that you could just, Mix human knowledge and and we would have this free encyclopedia, right? But what you got was human nonsense. You got human error. You got human lies. You got all of the bad stuff mixed in with the good. So he tried to do this thing where you didn't need editors and you didn't need gatekeepers. And Wikipedia very quickly realized that they needed editors and they needed gatekeepers. The rest of the social media environment continues and the online environment continues to be a wild west. As many people have said, I think it's exactly the right metaphor. It is a wild west full of gunslingers. There are no rules. We have to have rules. We've got to start regulating the environment. There have to start being gatekeepers. There has to be some sense that you can go back with a sense of trust to the efficacy of what you're seeing. And, 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 that, and Wikipedia has done that, right? Not in terms of interpretation. I'm not saying as a scholar, I'm always telling my students, you, know, you can't rely on it. But you can rely on Wikipedia for facts now. It's actually pretty good on facts. Mm -hmm. You want to check when, you know, when Gone with the Wind was published, it's going to get that right. Um, and it's going to take it down if it's a lie. So I think we need to get back to that kind of basic editorial gatekeeping. We need to accept as a society that we require that because we have to have a shared ground of historical factual, of factual reality because our political system is based on it. And without that, we don't have a good faith consensus-based politics. We can't. Um, so I, I, I have to believe that, that we'll get there, but, at, but we, are in a, um, we are in a chaotic situation, obviously, and um, and and the problem is the way in which power has been ceded to the to the big tech companies. And until they begin to be regulated and, and in my view, broken up um, uh, as the monopolies that they are, we're going to continue to be in trouble. Well, what's that's, interesting that's, to, to me, sir, about that view is it's not necessarily uh, I mean, it, it can be a bipartisan view because mm -hmm. they're equally upset with with them on the on the right, aren't they? I just wonder whether that is an area where there might be some sort of bipartisan progress. I mean, I suppose it's possible. Um, I'm, not, I'm not holding out a lot of hope for any kind of bipartisan mm -hmm. progress at the moment. But, and of course people are profiting off of that. So where there is profit, it's very hard to break that stuff down, but it can be done. It's been done in the past. What has been done can be done again. So I certainly think that that's where you start. And obviously as an educator, I'm gonna say education. Media literacy, knowing how to work out the accuracy of the sources of what you're looking at, um, knowing how to fact check, know, knowing how to sniff out 
um, untruths. These are all really important skills yeah. that we can teach young people as well. That, going back to the gerontocracy point, that was an appalling moment, wasn't it, when Mark Zuckerberg testified to yeah. the Senate committee, and they obviously not only have no idea what Facebook was, they, they didn't know how they made money, they didn't know yeah, exactly. all about it. I mean, it was well, how does how does advertising come into it? That's <laughs> right. It was yeah. just extreme. Yeah. What yeah. is an app? <laughs> what is this yeah. app thing just, of just, which you speak? I mean, it yeah. was just like on another planet entirely. Yeah. 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 Um, was, someone asked us to turn to foreign policy um, in the light of, of Biden's trip to Saudi Arabia and, and elsewhere mm. in the Arab world, but particularly the trip he made to cap in hand to the Saudis, as this person says, well, <laughs> what's, what's going to happen now with um, the, the next two years? Does, does Biden even have a foreign policy? You think of what happened in Afghanistan that, that is worth calling the name. I mean, I I think he does. I think he did anyway. I mean, and look, I, I should say first, it's not my area of expertise, but I think that the um, my my sense is that the again Biden is being left holding the bag for, uh, and this happens to presidents. Like you, you sign up for the job, this is what's going to happen, right? Mm. But there's an uh, you know there's an enormous amount of um, I can't, what's the, I don't know exactly what the, what the phrase is to say what I mean, but there's this kind of, you, you know, you get inserted into this, this incredibly powerful ongoing structural process that you think you can come in and reform. And it turns out, and even if you've been the vice president, even if you have all of the experience that Biden has, I think that every president gets taken aback by how many of those processes are out of their control and how many interests are conflicting there and how how much they find themselves unable to do the things that they think that they will be able to do. Now, does that include kissing the ring of the man who beheaded an American journalist? I mean, you know, doing the fist bump. I mean, I really, you know, as an American journalist, I could really have lived without that. Um, I think it was, um, you know, a, a PR disaster, certainly. And I think it was immoral. I wish he hadn't done it. But you know, I, I, I think that the it goes back to this problem about idealism and the realities of the messes in which we find ourselves. Um, I'm not going to defend it, but I am going to say that that I think that um, that that the idea that any American president could just kind of write the rules and and, you know, inhabit the world the way that he wants to is also, I think, naive. And Biden was naive in pretending that he could do that, claiming that he could do that. But I think it's equally naive to expect him to have been able to just do that. OK, final thought before Rosie comes back and um, and uh, sends us all on our way. Um, and it is about Trump because it fascinates us, doesn't it? I mean, he fascinates. Uh, uh, do, do you think he is going to stand again? You mentioned earlier on that he kind of needs to to avoid some degree of legal jeopardy. But number one. Um, it does look as if he's going to try, doesn't it? But number two, don't you think the Republicans actually will, mindful of quite a lot of what you've said about the people put off by Trump and Trumpism, might um, decide against him? I mean, uh, we'll have to see. I cannot get inside the head of Trumpists even remotely. And I, I again, I say that without really, it sounds like a facetious comment, but it isn't. Um, I can't understand anybody who could think that this guy is somebody who anybody should support let alone the second coming. So um, it, it is just absolutely foreign to the way that I think. So I don't pretend to be able to predict what they will do or what their ulterior motives are, to what degree they may, they may have some resistance to this or to what degree they're completely buying into it. It seems clear to me that senior Republican leadership would like to be rid of the problem that is Trump, but they are not willing to rid themselves of him. Um, so they're hoping the electorate will do it, but that's not currently what's happening. I do think that, um, that you know, as you say, Trump is making all the noises about wanting to stand again, he's, to run again, he says that he will. Um, he can raise a lot of money off the back of it. He just keeps, you know, he raises money off of all of this stuff and pockets it as far as I can tell. So um, everything is a money-making opportunity to him anyway. So um, so there's that. Um, I think that the, the real problem though now is that Trumpism is a thing. And regardless of whether Trump runs or doesn't, Run. Ron DeSantis is going to run. Ron DeSantis is smarter than Trump. He is more disciplined than Trump. He is a more successful politician than Trump. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's taken all of the lessons from Trump's playbook and he's going to implement them. There are other politicians who are trying to do the same thing. 
So I think that Trumpism is the problem that we haven't defeated. I think cynicism is the problem that we haven't defeated, but most of all, partisanship. We are in a country now where there are people who are so tribal about being Republican that they absolutely put it above everything else. So mm -hmm. I would just remind people if they watched any of the January 6 hearings that um, some of the Trump inner circle who testified before the committee as friendly witnesses. So for example, Secretary of State of Arizona, Rusty Bowers, who was this kind of, he looked like this kind of Jimmy Stewart figure who was standing there with clean cut and he was like, you know, I just, um, I believe that the constitution is divinely inspired and, um, and, and, I, and I could not go along with what Trump was asking me to do when Trump was asking him to, you know, uh, um, overturn the, the electoral results in Arizona. Afterwards, Rusty Bowers was asked if, so he gives this kind of, you know, ringing endorsement of American democracy, except there was this little problem that he thinks it's because it's divinely inspired. And, um, and then he was asked if he would vote for Trump again, and he said yes. Mm. Bill Barr was deposed saying that he, you know, who of course was Trump's AG, um, and he was deposed saying that he told the Trump, uh, he told Trump when he was the president um, that his claims about the, the election were, and I quote Barr, bullshit. Right, he's on, he's deposed over and over again, saying it was bullshit. I told him it was bullshit. It was bullshit. This is bullshit. And he was asked after he was deposed, would he vote for Trump again? And he said, yes, he would. Yeah. That's the problem. The problem is Trumpism. Back to the problem. The, pro the pro okay. problem is power. It's that they want power at all costs and they want what a president will give them at all costs, whether that is overturning Roe v. Wade or whether that is getting rich or whether that is, you know, over, you know, stop, you know, keeping fossil fuels going, whatever it may be, they're willing to pay whatever the democratic price is to get their agenda over the line. Okay, on that enormously cheerful note. Oh. So we, we have a <laughs> I'm like the I'm like the prophet of doom these days. I've, I'm like, <laughs> I like to tell people, I'm like I'm a nice person. I'm a cheerful person <laughs> by nature. I know, I know in real life, because I've done things with you face to face, you are the most cheerful person, <laughs> proper American in, in, in every respect. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for doing that. The book is wonderful. The wrath to come. And I think Rosie's going to say goodbye to everyone. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. That was fantastic. And Justin, too. Incredible to see America now through your eyes. And I, I guess, I mean, I'm you know, it's, America's been my story for all of my life, you know, from when I was a teenager reading On the Road and everything at that point about America was wonderful. It was everything we all wanted to be. Um, and it's an extraordinary journey to have followed it to today. And you just think, what on earth next? So thank you so much for your time. I, listen, I can't recommend this book um, enough. So please get in there and you'll have it by August the 4th. So at the latest, long, hopefully soon. At the latest. So get it because it will not only inspire you, but it will inspire an unbelievable amount of dinner party and just general conversation <laughs> and the pub. I never thought of that. Well, it will. <laughs> I mean, it's parties. such an interesting <laughs> subject because we're all in some way enthralled to America, whether it's the media or the music or the films or whatever. It's been such a beacon in everybody's life and there's something incredibly tragic of this feeling of this great country sort of stumbling into this uh this strange place that you can't get your head around so i couldn't thank you so so much for being with us and i hope we can catch up with you again say next year when the paperback comes out and just see what's happened because it's it's gripping it's history is really in the making under our eyes and Justin, you do this every morning so brilliantly, and um, I expect you'll be on tomorrow morning. And Sarah, congratulations <laughs> a million on your book. Um, thank thank so you very, very much for joining us. And come back, and we've got another um, event. We've got Karen Armstrong coming up, plus an event with um, Chris Blackhurst on uh, the absolutely scandalous story of the bank that was too big to fail and how they laundered the money of the Mexican cartels. As I said, you really can't make most of this stuff up. Um, there's no point in being a fiction writer. Thank you all, and thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Justin. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.